So I'm going to give a, a paper that's um, with some apologies, you know, filled with ideas that are still being rendered in some ways. Um, and I like to do that on purpose, just like I like to apologize for it on purpose, to kind of set in motion a sort of incompleteness, um, which I think for myself is characteristic of speculation. Um, I'm really interested in how it works through not working in some ways, right? And how the gaps and the leaps in logic and the irrationalities can actually serve to open up spaces, um, you know, through announcing themselves as errors in some ways. At the same time, I've always got this kind of desire to package a nicely glossy presentation, right? And so you'll see some of the tensions between those two things, I hope, play out in this. Um, also, just a quick thanks to, to uh, David, Mark, and Eldritch for organizing the event and for letting me be part of it. It's uh, fantastic to be here. So the paper is Nietzsche in B-flat, and the story goes like this. Last night I dreamed I was caught inside the mind of Friedrich Nietzsche, that in some way I was Friedrich Nietzsche, and perhaps with the same delirious logic of conflation that left him thinking himself the Antichrist. It's a nice sort of kind of... <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally there. It was not just any Nietzsche that had me entangled, however, but a strangely specific one. Not the thinker of supermen or prophets or even fools. Not the thinker of the eternal recurrence or the wills to power. But a Nietzsche instead that might have himself already been dreamed by someone else. The story is one I've had stuck in my mind for a while, maybe like a philosophical earworm or something, I guess. It's a story told by Arthur Croker in The Will to Technology of how Nietzsche, fully delirious at the end of his life, found comfort only by sitting in the living room of his mother's house at the piano, playing the same note over and over and over. Now, I love the anecdote because despite its simplicity, there's a resonant depth to it for me, a picture made more beautiful by its repetitive framing. It makes me wonder what sustained the interaction, the repetition of the gesture, the obsession over the note, the insistence on that one note and that one note alone. Was this a persistent attempt to make sure he had the note just right, repeating it over and over in fear that the next time he played it, it wouldn't sound the same anymore, or that it didn't sound quite right the last time, and that as soon as he let the note go, he forgot it and had to play it again? Or was it a responsive attempt to tune his own thoughts or his mind to something that he heard but nobody else did? Now the story is told only very, very briefly in Croker's text, and none of the details really come up. But what is there has been enough to capture my imagination for a number of years. I've dreamed it before, periodically calling me to revisit the search for more details about the story in the library, online, in biographies and critiques and reviews, and I found nothing. So much nothing, in fact, that it makes me wonder whether my dream wasn't simply a repetition of a dream Croker had first, inventing the story in his own delirious way as both an homage and a parody to the mad Zarathustra. But that's what's interesting about dreams. They don't know the difference between what's real and what's not. They only know what grabs their attention. And then they make it real, for a time, even if it's only an imaginary version of the real. But sometimes the imaginary lingers, and sometimes dreams are slow to fade. There was one part that was particularly confusing for me, though. Throughout the dream and afterwards, I had no idea what note I was playing. My eyes were never on the piano, and not even my peripheral vision carried with it a sense of what my fingers pushed. And so it made me wonder, what was the key that I was playing? What was the note that I was hearing, that I had just been playing, that Nietzsche, by Croker's account, sat and played over and over and over? My fingers were sore, my eyes was numb, but my ears were ringing and burning, and the sound would not let up. Now, there's no way to know, of course, with any degree of critical certainty or even plausibility. But in many ways, it seems to me that the act of throwing out plausibility is a great point of intellectual departure for speculative thinking. The challenge then for which is to see whether the stories can be woven together or even entangled such that they are made to linger. Like in dreams, even imaginary causes can have real effects 
And perhaps then the same is true in some ways in the stakes of the question of tuning speculation. Ten years ago, there was a different story that caught my attention in different ways, yet ways almost as striking as the story of Nietzsche's note. It's possible also that the story caught me, um, caught my attention so, with so much force because I've wondered so often what Nietzsche's note might have been. The story is one about how NASA scientists had found that, strangely, certain wave frequencies were seeming to escape from black holes they were measuring. A quote from the New York Times. Astronomers say they've heard the sound of a black hole singing, and what it is singing, and perhaps has been singing for more than two billion years, is B-flat. A B-flat 57 octaves lower than middle C. The notes appear as pressure waves, rolling and spreading as a result of outbursts from a supermassive black hole through a, a hot, thin gas that fills the Perseus cluster of galaxies. They are 30,000 light years across and have a period oscillation of 10 million years. By comparison, the lowest, deepest note that humans can hear have a period of about 1 20th of a second. The black hole is playing the lowest note in the universe, said Dr. Andrew Fabian, an X-ray astronomer at Cambridge. It makes me wonder what it would mean if this note, B-flat, was also the note that was so seductive to Nietzsche. I read another story recently online about how B-flat, two octaves below middle C, will cause crocodiles to howl. When I shared this story with my students, I had, a, I had one woman raise her hand with surprise and say that the sound of a B-flat note had always bothered her too. <laughs> Maybe it's a thing, I don't know. I also don't know what to do with the different examples except to leave them alone while insist insisting that they have something in common, even if I don't quite know what that is. But it also makes me wonder whether any kind of deeper meaning might be found in this linkage. For if the NASA scientists are right, and the universe does indeed emit a B-flat sound, then I can't help but think that existential theory needs to be rethought in some way to factor this in. And I'm thinking in particular of that version of existentialism that grew from the moment where Albert Camus famously stood up, addressed the universe, and asked for the answer to the question of the meaning of life. He asked the question, peering up at the nighttime sky, staring into the void of space and into the vast infinite before him, wondering whether life had purpose, what that purpose might be. His question wasn't really a question, of course. It was a demand that purpose be presented as an answer to the challenges and absurdities of lived existence, a question not just of the world and of life, but of the universe itself. But to Camus, the universe answered in silence. Now, I suppose we could ask why the universe gave NASA a different answer than it gave Camus. <laughs> but the fact would nonetheless remain that for Camus, this silence became the foundational context for the birth of the absurd and of existential indifference. But it was also something else. The silence was an insult, and the metaphysical task of a philosophical generation became that of standing up to silence, looking for ways in which the absurdity of an absent response might be integrated within a framework of human understanding. The reason Camus was such a prescient thinker is that he understood that the technological destiny of silence was to mean loudly, even if no words were exchanged. In silence, Camus saw the technological horizon of already constituted meaning, not as a technological manifestation, but as a deeply human problem. Most absurd of all is the human ins insistence on presence, forever unwilling and unable to leave quiet the questions. But it's possible that Nietzsche knew better, and taking a page from the game of Cage heard precisely a possibility or a variation within the silence that Camus missed. If that's so, Nietzsche perhaps went even a step further, not simply making a spectacle out of listening to the silence of the world, but attempting to play along. One note, over and over and over, even if it wasn't quite right, even if it wasn't deep enough or long enough, a B-flat soundtrack for the lonely house around him. Unlike for Camus, for Nietzsche, the absurdity of the challenge may not have been the indifference of a silent insult, but the strange persistence of an answer to a question he had never overtly asked, an answer that became a mantra, a mantra that became a singular, a singular note played over and over on the piano in a last attempt to tune his thinking to whatever it was that was occupying his attention. Now there's more at stake here than it might at first seem. 
not simply a vague metaphysical conflation of stories, even that, if that's part of what I find most interesting to engage. There are lessons from this conflation that can be used to expand our ways of thinking more ubiquitous questions of technology as well. I think in particular of the social conundrum noted, noted by so many theorists of network technology and social platforms, the way electronic culture both connects us to one another in increasingly technical ways and isolates us materially in ways that threaten the traditional forms of material relationships. I'm drawn to the way Sherry Turkle frames the question of one of, as one of being alone together, isolated physically but hyper-connected in ways so pervasive that we never quite feel left to ourselves. Seen socially and politically, the formulation makes an amount of sense, but I'm more interested in how it begins to tear apart when we generalize this technical relationship to a metaphysics of electronic, uh, electronic presence. Again, I think of Nietzsche at his piano, and I wonder how different that is from me and my computer this morning, meditating on the last notes of this presentation, that is from, uh, sorry, meditating on the last notes of this presentation while checking in with the sounds of my own digital universe at the same time. Are they forms of tuning or attunement that carry similar philosophical weight or momentum or possibilities? They might not seem to at first, but if we enter that line of speculation, it becomes possible to formulate the beginnings of a deeply counterintuitive claim that against the critique of digital culture as one of distracted and frenetic isolation, perhaps just the opposite is true and the real seduction of the virtual is its metaphysical aspiration and its speculative possibilities for putting ourselves in the pathway of things we can't actually see, see or hear on our own. Perhaps speculation is directly tied in some way to the sites we want to speculate against. Perhaps speculation has always been a virtual, even a technological way of thinking. And in some ways it's fitting, since the physicists who discovered the sound of the universe, universe can no more hear the note than we, relying on their instruments of technology to render the sound, to tell them, in other words, exactly what they are not themselves hearing, at which point they begin to speculate and imagine. And we do too, joining all of us together with the imaginary sound of this long, deep note, and in the process reminding us that whether scientifically minded or mad, checking in with the universe is only a keystroke away. But that's what attunement is in some ways, isn't it? Not an informatic process, but an emotional one not about the data at all, but about how the data circulates through us. It's how Heidegger defines attunement, at least, not as a competitive process of distilling right answers from wrong answers through critical processing, but a matter of altering moods. And it's important to note that the logic of moods is distinctly different from the logic of critical thinking. Most notably for Heidegger is the insistence that to change a mood does not require that you deconstruct or critique or unravel the mood that you're looking to change. All you have to do is institute a counter mood. It strikes me as a deeply different form of logic, one where we, don't, where we no longer need a reason to change our minds. All we have to do is realize that we can if we want to. Smooth logic, delirious logic, dangerous logic. It may also be a form of imagining or dreaming brought out of the bedroom and into the world of speculation and perhaps more interesting into the world of science and technology as well. Aesthetics made real. It makes me think of Marshall McLuhan, and in particular, the end of McLuhan's life, after the stroke that stole his voice and rendered him silent. When he couldn't speak anymore, he could still sing. No more data, but a persisting ability to express his moods in other ways. The most famous story is one about how, when joined, when joined for dinner by an overtly argumentative colleague, McLuhan turned up the radio in his living room to drown out the voice of his companion creating that form of digital noise that so often gets talked about as the new sound of silence. But in this moment, it's important to note that McLuhan's tactic was one of exactly attunement in Heidegger's sense, altering the moment not through critique, but by oversaturating the sounds of the space, instituting a counter mood. But what happens when the language of altering moods leaves the anecdotal stage? We heard yesterday about some of the dangers of an aesthetic thinking that ignores its political dimension, and indeed, when reading Heidegger, one should probably always stop to realize that the seductive charm of his smooth metaphysical renderings have their own histories of abuse. But what I think is perhaps more important than the politics here is strangely the science, a seemingly new language of science in which informatics is beginning to be spoken in a language of attunement. This is certainly true for technology, 
with new generations of devices offer, offering us the affect-charged possibility for a digital lifestyle companion, and even some of the newer en entrainment products that literally tell us, literally tell us, that they can help us think and feel better. In some ways, the iPod's just a miniaturized version of McLuhan's radio, for example, a system through which we alter our moods towards the world by simply changing what we hear. The proliferation of consumer-grade brainwave headsets also do this especially well. Devices like Mindwave and Muse, which promise programs to help us control our stress, focus our mental energies, control our emotional cap uh, capacities. They promise to tune us and to help us tune ourselves. There's even a device called Aurora that will help you change your dreams, making them more lucid, more productive, more enjoyable. It works by flashing lights in your eyes while you sleep, speaking through the body to the dream in ways that blur not only boundaries between bodies and devices, but between the technological, the ideological, and the imaginary. In some ways, I might want to talk about how this flashing light uses a form of digital blindness that is un not unlike McLuhan's amplified radio, interrupting the dream narrative and signaling a reality of its own. The aim of the Aurora device is to help you wake up inside the dreams that it already knows you're having. The dreams within which it finds itself first, and then from which it signals to you that you're there too. Come join me in your dream. Not just tuning how we feel anymore, but really beginning to tune how we imagine. And so I may have dreamed of Nietzsche last night, but now it's technology promising to help dream me. What remains to be seen is which note I'll be tuned to along the way. Thanks.